Hi everyone, Lara Danzel here with the Vermilion County Conservation District. Today I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking with you about how plants and animals interact with each other. And then I also want to talk about how there's non-living things in our habitat that also interact with those plants and animals too. So whenever you have these non-living components with the living components interacting and in the same area together, we can call that an ecosystem. So one part of our non-living environment that we have in our habitat is our soil. So there's different types of soil that you can have. You can have a clay soil, you can have rich loamy soil with different types of minerals and nutrients. There's also different levels of moisture that you can have in your soil. So your soil conditions are going to determine what type of plants that you have living in your habitat. So for example, here we have some jewelweed growing. This soil that we have here is very moist. There's a lot of moisture in the, in the soil. So this jewelweed will grow here. It's these beautiful orange colored flowers. What is so unique and special about the jewelweed is how it is a late summer blooming plant in our forest habitat. It blooms purposely late because it helps our hummingbirds and our butterflies with their southern migration as they head south for the winter. And standing here right now, there's all kinds of jewelweed even on both sides of the trail right here. I can hear hummingbirds. I can see the hummingbirds floating along. So the soil conditions have brought in the jewelweed. The jewelweed then brings in the hummingbirds and the butterflies. And that interaction right there is what helps make up part of an ecosystem. We live in a global economy. America is continually trading, importing, and exporting all types of materials with other countries, including wood. One shipment came from Asia back in 2002, and on that shipment of wood, it had an insect called the emerald ash borer. The emerald ash borer is not native here to America. It's not supposed to be in our ecosystems that we have over here. There was no natural predator for it. So it was able to reproduce and spread like crazy across the United States. And the damage that it has done is evident right here with this ash tree. Emerald ash borers, the female will lay her eggs underneath the bark of the tree. When that egg hatches into the larva, the larva will dig and burrow tunnels underneath the bark. That disrupts the xylem and the phloem level that's right underneath this bark. And it doesn't allow minerals and nutrients to transport up and down this tree. So the emerald ash borer is a negative impact that we can have on our ecosystems here that was brought in by humans. It is estimated that the emerald ash borer has killed tens of millions of trees across the Midwest. I do also want to point out, however, that there are positive impacts that humans can have on ecosystems. We can definitely make sure that we take care of our environment. We don't want to litter or leave like our fishing line behind along the edge of a pond whenever we're done fishing because animals could get tangled up in the line. We can clean up after ourselves. We can plant native plants in our backyard. We can also make sure that we set aside conservation areas for these plants and animals to grow. So I don't want you to just think humans have a negative impact on our environment and our ecosystems because they can have a positive impact as well. Some natural factors that can impact an ecosystem would be like a strong storm that's coming through. That strong storm might have some high winds that might topple over some large mature trees in the forest. If those trees had animals like birds or squirrels living in them, now those birds and squirrels had to find another place to live. Maybe there were woodpeckers that were feeding off the insects that were living in that tree. Now that woodpecker has to find someplace else to find food. You can also have those strong storms with lightning strikes and cause a fire. And we're seeing that a lot right now with the uh, fires that we have out in western United States. Droughts can also happen. So right now I'm at an aquatic habitat that we like to call a marsh. And if you look back there, you can see how the marsh level has dropped several feet because we haven't had a whole lot of rain this, last, this late summer. When you have droughts and your water levels lower in a pond or a marsh habitat, all of the frogs and the fish 
are now concentrated, living together in this smaller pool of water. If a great blue heron were to come over here, or maybe a raccoon, they're gonna be able to get the frogs and the fish out of this water a lot easier because it's more concentrated. Those fish and frogs are living closer together. Maybe there's a beaver that likes to live in this marsh. When the water level gets low, beaver's not gonna be very happy, so he's going to have to move to a larger body of water. So animals and plants are continually having to change and adapt anytime there's a natural or a human impact on their ecosystem. Plants and animals are resilient. They're able to withstand small changes to their ecosystems. The reason why is because plants and animals have adaptations. Sometimes there's structural adaptations on their body that help them survive. Sometimes it might be a behavioral adaptation. The whole study of all of these components together in an ecosystem, the non-living with the living and the plants and the animals is called ecology. And a scientist who studies ecology is called an ecologist.